This server is amazing. Inside this 2U server, there are four independent AMD EPIC nodes. And while companies have been making 2U four node servers for many years, this server has something special. In the rear, it has extra memory channels that are connected to each node that makes this server possible. And so let's get into one of the most exciting servers I've seen recently. Hey guys, this is Patrick from STH, and this is an amazing ASUS server. Now I've seen this server and we've covered it a few times on the STH main site. Mostly we've seen this server at different trade shows. And every time I have seen this server at a trade show, I have thought it was awesome. And I've told ASUS, I wanna go and show this to our audience. That's because this server solves a fundamental physical problem with a 2U four node chassis that it's kind of just solving a problem in a very novel, unique way that I think a lot of folks are gonna like. And hey, real quick, just to get access to the server, it actually was less expensive to fly me to the server than it was to fly the server to me. So I ended up doing a trip to Taiwan to be able to show you this along with some of the other pieces that we did at the same time. And so, you know, we had to say that Asus is sponsoring this because, well, we, we had a fly to Taiwan. So today we're gonna show you around, let's get to it. Okay, so let's get inside one of the nodes and talk all about the cool features. For example, starting at the front of the server, you're gonna see that we have something that's a little different than a lot of other F2 four node servers. And the big thing here is that we have front IO plus storage, but that also means that we need to have our expansion slot. So a lot of times you'll see that, you know, you have storage on one end, expansion slots on the other, but that's not how this is set up. Instead, you'll see that we have our storage. So we have two, two and a half inch storage bays here. And then we have two network card slots or I guess PCIe expansion slots. Now the first one is actually a PCIe low profile expansion slot like we would expect, but the one below that is an OCP NIC 3.0 slot. Now, something fun with this is that the next little bit has a lot of our PCIe cables as well as our postcode LED. And we've been reviewing ASUS 2 4 node servers for years, and they used to have the postcode LED on the back or on the front of the system, but now it's actually inside. But at least you can tell if there's something wrong. The second one, which is also kind of neat, is that just behind that, we have a single socket node. Now this is an AMD Epic 9004 and 9005 series. So that's, you know, Genoa, Bergamo, Turin, Turin uh, Dense, I guess would be the other one. But you have the ability to go put a normal AMD Epic processor in here, but you only need one because you have such a high core count that you don't need that second socket. And that is a huge deal because it means that this node can be much shorter. The other thing that it gives you is it gives you 12 channels of memory. Now these are DDR5 memory channels and depending on what kind of SKU you have and all that, you can have up to I think DDR5, 6,000, 6,400, somewhere in that range. Now, the important thing about this is that the CXL memory well, that really augments the memory that you're seeing here. So there are some designs out there that have two DIMMs per channel. So we have 12 channel chip, one DIMM per channel, that gives us our 12 DIMMs. Two DIMMs per channel is 12 channels times two, which is 24 DIMMs. And that just absolutely packs components into a system. The challenge with that is that just by placing those extra DIMM slots, you actually lose your memory performance because the memory will downclock automatically in the processor. This situation here where we have all just one DIMM per channel, 12 channels of memory, means that we don't have that issue at all. But what we do have is a very dense system. And so you'll see that this heatsink is huge. It goes all the way from the actual socket itself and has little wings that go out and allow the system to dissipate more heat over more heatsink area, even though this is essentially a 1U height and half width system. So that's really the reason that you're gonna see that set up around the CPU socket. Now just past the CPU socket, that's where we see some of our just kind of basic things that you need to get any node working. A great example of that is the A-Speed AST 2600 BMC, which is down over here, and that provides all of our baseboard management features. And that baseboard management feature allows you to have your management right here, where you have your management port, which is your out-of-band management port, and then you also have two USB ports. Next to that, you'll also see a VGA port, and that allows you to have a VGA monitor and a keyboard and a mouse if you want 
want to do local administration. Now, all the way at the back of the node, you're going to see a couple of features that are really unique to the system. First, you know, we have guide pins to make sure that you're putting it into the system and the overall chassis correctly. But then we also have things like, you know, we need power in our node. And so we have a connector for that. And then we have these two connectors right here, which are CPU. And these are specifically the PCIe Gen 5 by 16 connectors. And why these connectors matter is that these are the ones that go to the back of the system board to the mid plane and allow us to start doing CXL or potentially PCIe out of the back of this node. So the nodes slide in and there's two stacked one on top of another. And then they go into this area right here, which has our power and also has our data connections to the rear of the server. So the PCIe Gen 5 by 16 or CXL communication happens here. We have a retimer. So that way the signal could be retimed from the original board to this mid plane board and then out through these cables. And then from here, we also have our fans. And then in the back is really the most exciting part about this entire thing. And that is the CXL boards. Now this board right here, you can see has a total of eight dims. So there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight dims. And there are four controllers. Now these CXL controllers are from a company called Montage Technology. You've probably seen them on uh, maybe even the dims and they make some all kinds of components. So instead of a dim going directly to a CPU, the dim goes to a CXL memory controller that CXL memory controller goes out through a PCIe cabled connection or a CXL cabled connection to the retimer. And then it goes through this edge connector and out into the node. That's how the system provides that CXL connectivity. Now, something that I realized is that not everybody has a great grasp on what CXL is. I mean, if you were to go look at the system and how a lot of people explain it, including myself a lot of times, you know, you just think that like, oh, CXL means that you can take DIMMs, put them in with a little controller, and then you can have access to memory directly out of the CPU. So let's take a step back and really talk about the three types of CXL devices. The first one is a type one device. My best example of this is always if you have a NIC or an accelerator and you want to go and access memory on the host CPU. Now, the next one is the type two device. And this was probably the one that I think most folks were super excited about just as we started to get to like the AI and GPU build outs. You know, the idea of being able to, if you have say a GPU with HBM memory and you have a CPU also with DRAM and being able to go as a like CPU, go across the CXL and go into the GPU's HBM memory directly or vice versa and have the GPU go into the main memory. At first, a lot of folks were really excited about that because it seemed like a good way to get more memory access. But on the other hand, going over PCIe has kind of fallen out of favor compared to things like NVLink and also, you know, the Infinity Fabric links and all those high speed interfaces. Now, the one that has taken off first is really the CXL Type 3 device. This is essentially what we're looking at in this ASUS system where you have a CXL controller on one end with some memory, and then you also have a CPU. The CPU is able to go out over the CXL link to that memory controller, and that memory controller has additional DIMMs installed. And on these slides, you're gonna see things like CXL.io, CXL.mem, CXL.cache. And the reason for that is that there's three different really protocols or modes that the CXL is running in. And those are important because when you have the the actual link that is a PCIe or CXL link, what you'll see is that when you plug a CXL device in or you force it, you will see that that link uses the same physical layer. So the same wires that go through the PCB and all that kind of stuff, but the actual protocol level, it's running something different. So you'll see that the agents that are on the CPU are actually running a different protocol than they would be if they were running standard PCIe, even though we're using the same physical wire. Now we've gotten into it in some of our hot chips coverage but that actually has huge implications for things like, you know, when you have to go and update cache hierarchies and stuff like that, when things in memory change, um, and it gets way more complex in future generations of CXL. Now, what we're looking at here is a CXL 2.0 device, but really it's a relatively simple CXL 2.0 topology. The eventual vision of CXL is not just that you can go and plug a couple of memory modules into a controller board, whether that's PCIe or a custom board like this, 
and then plug that into a server. Instead, the idea is that you're gonna have shared memory pools. So you can think of like an entire chassis where the entire chassis just has these little memory controllers. It hooks up via a switch, and then that switch is shared among multiple memory modules as well as multiple hosts. So imagine having a box in your data center where you have say 10 terabytes of memory, 20 terabytes of memory, or something like that. Then you have the entire rack that's able to use that memory and provision it on the fly. So with modern CPUs, if you have a CPU socket that's fairly large plus 12 channel memory, if you were to go to two dims per channel, there are two main problems. The first one is of course, that you just run out of physical space to be able to just fit all of those dims if you're only trying to go half of a 19 inch rack, right? Like physically, you just can't put that many devices in there. The second challenge is that whenever you even put the extra dim slots on the motherboard, you'll see that the memory clocks will go and drift down a bit because you have to drive that signal over a further distance. That creates a little extra challenge, right? Because even if you're not populating those, your system will run its memory at a lower you know, clock speed, which means you get lower performance and that's not necessarily necessarily the best. So what Asus is doing in this server, and we're gonna show you all around this, is they are actually adding, using CXL memory, these custom modules in the back to be able to expand the memory footprint and the number of DIMMs that are installed in a server without having to sacrifice either the density of two U4 nodes or sacrificing the memory bandwidth that goes along with adding, you know, just extra DIMM slots. In fact, they're actually adding additional memory bandwidth by adding those additional DIMMs via the CXL controllers. Now, the important thing to remember, especially when you have something like an AMD Epic processor, is that when you do things like quality of service on your memory, or you just have, you just wanna have extra capacity or whatever, the memory bandwidth limitations that you have, we're really talking about the direct DDR5 channels and that direct bandwidth between the DDR5 that's directly attached to that CPU and, uh, and you know, that CPU, right? But the other side to it is that the CXL is not something that's included in that. So technically CXL memory bandwidth is something that is in addition to the just, you know, dim slots that you see. Of course, in this ASUS server, it's a little bit less of a challenge just because you're so constrained with having four nodes in a 2U form factor. There's just not enough space to really utilize all of the IO lanes of a AMD Epic 9000 5 series processor. So each node gets eight DIMMs. It has its four controllers, two PCIe re timers, and that allows you to put more capacity. Now, in this particular example, we have 32 gigabyte DIMMs because we're just trying to keep everything the same across the CPU as well as the CXL slots. But what that allows you to do is also have more memory slots per node, even though you're in this very small to you four node, very dense system. And because you have those extra DIMM slots, it allows you to use lower cost and lower capacity DIMM. So you don't have to jump up to like 128 gig DIMMs as quickly. Instead, you can just use these 32 gig DIMMs and not have to jump up to 64. You can use 64 gig DIMMs and not have to jump up to that 128. There are all kinds of different options here and really it's enabled by simply having more slots. And because of that on the back, all we have is really our power supplies. And so with that, let's go see why all of the CXL stuff matters and how it works and it looks in the system. Guys, I'm so excited to show you how this works. So what we did was we actually found a nice conference room that had all the power that we needed to run these four nodes. And what's really going on here is in the front, we have our node. And then in the back, we have our CXL. And how this works, you can see it on the topology here. You can see that we have our 384 gigabytes of memory in our NUMA node zero. In NUMA node one, we have another 256 gigabytes of memory for 640 gigabytes total. Now, the cool thing about this is that we're not using high-end DIMMs. We're just using 32 gig, pretty low cost DIMMs. And we're continuing to get our memory at DDR5 6400 on the CPU Plus we get additional bandwidth from the CXL memory. So we aren't losing memory bandwidth from adding more DIMMs. Instead, we're just adding memory bandwidth. Now, of course, something that you'll see is that we do get a little bit higher of latency to the CXL memory. It's a little bit higher for sure, but we get more bandwidth at a little bit higher latency and we also get more memory capacity, all good things. So overall, that's a pretty good trade-off. 
Of course, you're probably wondering what's the impact of adding this extra CXL memory into the system. What we did was we just loaded up one of our virtualization benchmarks. We're using KVM. And the idea here is, of course, we have an SLA on each workload and the workload can take a number of different sizes of VMs. Really, the idea here is we're trying to see when a CPU and system can no longer support more VMs at a given SLA. And so what we did was we ran the workload both with and without the CXL memory. And what you'll see pretty quickly is that we are able to run more virtual machines when we're using that CXL memory. And that's really the whole point of this, right? To have that additional memory with a little bit more memory bandwidth and to give you just the ability to use those cores that you have on a processor a little bit more efficiently. Now, of course, CXL is a huge topic and there's actually a lot more complexity that folks are building into it. But I just want to show something that was fairly simple just to kind of give you the mental model of like what's going on with CXL. Also, why it's not just straight PCIe and why you might want to use something like this. And hey guys, I'd love to hear what you guys think of the server because I think it's super cool, but other folks may think like this is perfect. Other folks may say, I don't understand. And I just love to hear your feedback and where you might use it or my, why you wouldn't use it. But I wanna get to some of our key lessons learned. And I think for me, the biggest key lesson learned was really just that this is a new paradigm, right? It's always been for years that to add extra memory, the option was to go from one DIMM per channel to two DIMMs per channel. But in today's modern processor world, you just don't have enough room to get to that two DPC add those extra like 12 dim slots. So having a solution like this, where you can add memory via CXL, I think is pretty awesome. It just gives you more capacity. And the coolest part is that you're able to get that extra capacity without having to go down that path of lowering the clocks due to going to that two DPC architecture, but also just in a system like this, you physically can't fit all of those dim slots. You can't put 24 dim slots or, you know, that many dim slots in a half width system because there's just, there's just not enough room. The other big benefit is that you're able to do this with a single processor instead of getting that memory capacity with two processors, which lowers your overall power consumption. Hey guys, look, we've reviewed many single socket AMD Epic servers over the years, but this provides something that's just, well, it's just so different that I just really like the look of it. And I'd love to hear again what you guys think. If you did like this video, well, why don't you share it with your friends and colleagues, but also give it a like, click subscribe, and turn on this notification so you can see whenever we come out with great new videos. As always, thanks for watching. Have an awesome day.